Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have Spencer Pascal here today, and he is an, a commercial investor, and he has some great information that he's going to want wants to pass on to our listeners. He started from zero, and he worked his way up to two multi-million dollar companies, and he has some great advice to share. So, Spencer, tell us a little about yourself and what you do. Hey, and thank you for having me on today. Uh, this is really exciting. Um, yeah, so I've, uh, I started probably about eight or nine years ago in the industrial uh, real estate side. I started working with my dad and um, just kind of learning the ropes, learning a little bit about that side that's very new to kind of people. You know, they everyone hears about industrial, Amazon, warehousing, but, you know, to me, that's all I knew it was. And then I really got into it and uh, it's been uh, quite the journey and, and uh, a ton of fun. Um, so currently, that's what I do. I, I I uh, build industrial warehousing. I also uh, buy and uh, lease and manage warehousing. Um, I currently have, uh, between my dad and I have about 1.6 million square feet of industrial in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, we also have a, a funding company, which I started um, probably about two and a half years ago, um, where we raise capital um, to buy larger equity or assets out there. Um, on top of that, we started a a podcast series that goes into these type of crazy individuals who have also other crazy ideas and start a really cool idea. So, you know, in the last eight or nine years, we've really developed three major uh, core things for the company that have uh, really boosted us in a different direction. Wow, that sounds really interesting. You know, a lot of people are interested in real estate, at least a lot of people that I know that are interested in buying and selling, flipping, and trying to build a business out of it. And you know, how did you really begin? Like when you started from scratch and you started to work your way up, what are some of the tips and the, some of the tools you use to build yourself up to the point where you are now? Yeah, so it's, that's where my, my learning curve was so much different. And, um, you know, I tell a lot of like a lot of younger people in my spot, you know, I, I never flipped houses. I never did any of that. Uh, you know, I recently just bought my first townhome maybe 60 or 90 days ago. And it was, you know, every day I buy buildings and it was the craziest process I've ever gone through. Um, but it's just it's they're two different processes. And so, you know, on the commercial side, uh, my dad's done his entire life. He's been doing this for 40 years. I didn't think I was going to want to get into this. It's not really what I wanted to do. Um and so when I got into it, it was, there was a lot to learn. And I think, you know, the biggest thing that got me through where I am now and all that was that mentorship process through it. You know, someone who really know all the, who knew all the mistakes already, who knew, hey, this is bad. Don't do this. Hey, do that. Um, short my learning curve by so much. I mean, there was, there was things that took maybe 10 or 15 years to learn that I could have learned in a 30 minute conversation we had. So all that knowledge really got crushed down really quickly. And I always tell everyone, like, the best advice I can give you, whether you like selling cars, furniture, you want to do a podcast, you want a marketing company, you need to find someone who's already done it, who has mastered it. Um, and if it costs you some money, it could be the best investment you've done. Naturally, I didn't have to do that because it was my father. But, um, you know, it was it was a great investment for me. You know, I moved back in with him. I said, I'm just going to eat and sleep and do this every day. And, um, you know, just start to figure out that over time between where my education level was and where I want to be, there had to be, there had to be some, you know, change in step a little bit. And I think that's what was, that was tough for me. Cause you know, when people ask like, well, how do I get started? That's, that's my answer to them. It's like either find somebody who's going to show you the ropes, be a mentor and get you there. Who's already done it or go be a broker and learn every small little step. Um, you know, learn how to do that, learn how to find buildings, learn how to do that. Um, and that, you know, that's a good stepping stone as well. Yeah, a lot of people um, talk about how is real, you know, when they talk about the buying and selling of houses, but how different is it when you're dealing with commercial buildings? Because it can be very costly, but yet when the market's right, you can make a very big profit, you know, when you, especially when you're buying commercial buildings. Yeah, it's so it, it's. It's totally like you can flop it completely, right? So it, it depends what you're getting into. If you, you, I always say section off commercial real estate it's into two sections. I have it right. Like, so you have um, retail, which is like your strip centers where you have food stores, nail salons, all that stuff. Those are your strip centers. Those are your, um, you have that. Then you have your industrial side. 
Uh, and you also have like pharmaceutical on that, but you're just in touch warehousing and all that. So to me, I started to figure out just between, even if you took residential out of it, between uh, your strip centers and your commercial and your industrial side, those are two different worlds as well. Yeah. Two different things to get loans on, two different things, construction budget, two different tenants. You know, an industrial building, I can go there. I can, what's called vanilla shell is you go in there, you paint all the ceilings white, you sweep it, you clean it. And it's just basically a large garage. Yeah. And somebody will pay me a lot of money for it, um, depending on how the year is. Um, do a five-year lease or 10-year lease, and I'll never talk to them again. Right. right. I can go to a retail center every time a little thing's wrong. Apart, they complain about this. They complain about that. They complain. They're more. Uh, you need to give them. They're more attentive, and they're more needy a little bit. I would say on that side. Yeah, they could still have that five or ten year. But I think when you when you upgrade to different professionalism of someone's career, right? So when when you're in residential, you're still doing the same thing. Uh, you have an emergency on a weekend, then you have to figure out how to get someone there at 11 p.m. on a Sunday night. In commercial, a lot of these guys, industrial side, a lot of these guys don't work on weekends. So you get to be away. You get to be time with your family. You get to do this. So I found that I've played all three of those roles. And on the industrial side, I started like being able to have more professional tenants. Um, you know, I could spend money in the landscaping and put flower pots out. And people don't go and put cigarette buds in or use it as a trash can. Like they appreciate how their building looks. Um, now, all that comes at different costs too. Um, you know, building an, a larger industrial building, a new roof on it is a lot more than, you know, a residential um, HVAC units for your heat and AC. Those cost a lot more. Um, yeah. And so I, the expense is a lot more, but again, you know, you still have to understand that like a lot of people still do the industrial flipping a little bit, but I love it. I mean, you know, you don't get a lot of tenants that really stay long-term on the on the other sides, you know, residential short, you know, that's it's just a shorter term. Um, turnover rates higher, and on the industrial side, it's great. I mean, you could buy a set of buildings. Like I had no idea buildings in my portfolio that someday I know I'll be able to give my kids, and they'll have it. And uh, or someday I know that will put my kid in college. Um, yeah. I know uh, I know of one building off the top of my head that allowed me to be able to buy a house this year. So it, there's certain things that I just noticed professionalism wise, and and you know, the timing and the expense wise was so much better in that area. Um, and it's a challenging area. It's so much harder to find those type of buildings. Um, yeah. And so I don't know, I just, you know, that that's kind of my big difference. Um, the mortgage wise, mortgage wise and all that's a whole never a whole nother ball game. But, um, but compare wise, totally night and day. Now, when you want to go into this business of commercial real estate, do you have to have a lot of money or equity behind you? Or is this something that you could figure it out and you can get you start with your first building with maybe X amount of dollars and then, you know, you could buy it and you can make money off of maybe the, the, the lease in part or make money off of people who are renting it. And then eventually, if you want to, you want to sell it, you could sell it like What's the pro what's the process like? How much money do you need to get into this business industry? Yeah, so again, I my learning curve was different. I was in a different spot. I had someone who wouldn't allow me to go and buy that stuff. But you can go to you can go to cities anywhere, right? And you could buy something. Um, you could refinance your house, pull hundred grand out of that, and put a hundred grand down as your down payment on on your property. Um, so you can always start small, like the same way you could start residential, you could do it in commercial. I always tell, I have, I have friends who do the residential flip and the, all that stuff. And I'm like, just do it on the commercial side. The payday is better. The long-term effect, um, yeah. is so much better. You know, if the tenants are responsible for everything at the end of the day, if they clog the entire bathroom with the sewer pipe, you'll get it done for free, but they're going to reimburse you because they caused it. Um, with yeah. residential, you, you know, you can't do that. So you know, when people say, you know, how do I get started in that? I'm like, well, the same amount of money you're investing into the the residential side, you're doing it one because you think, oh, this is easier. Let me just do this. It's the same mm -hmm. amount of work. The biggest issue you're going to have is your banks. Your banks are going to look at you and say, hey, Spencer, we know you have a million six square feet of industrial real estate. Uh, we know you want to buy this apartment complex that has 300 units, but you've never done this. So we're not going to approve you for that. So right. even somebody at our level, they used to look at us and go like, yeah, but you don't know how to do that. You don't know how to run that. You don't know how to lease that. Right. So 
Um, I would say the biggest thing to do is I, you know, I've heard brokers say that they will do uh, give up their commissions in order to get equity inside of property. So basically they don't have to come up with any money. They basically will lease out the property instead of asking for a commission. That'll basically go towards the percentage within the property. So there's ways like that being into the broker community, learning those people, understanding these investors um, that, you know, we've done that on a couple of jobs before. Um, the other way is, um, you know, finding something that's, you know, a little dirty and maybe in not the best neighborhood, but you're like, you know what? There's got to be this type of market in this neighborhood, no, where I, no matter where I go. Yep, it's got chains on the front, but you know what? It's my start. Um, yeah. Or the other thing is just um, just keep saving and just keep yeah. saving and, and, and something's going to come along. Um, you know, I have started to see this thing of, you know, the best for us buying properties was when there was family or something involved. Where there's like, mm -hmm. hey, the brothers have to separate, brothers got to sell, you know. It was easy for us to play that family card so it helped, but everyone yeah. always has their little secret. Um, but I would I would say save your money. If you need to go the residential route, do that. But the brokerage route is really, really good if you can't get that mentor. If you get a mentor, they will absolutely find a way to get you into a deal after time, you know, right. especially if you could find a deal. And th the biggest thing people don't understand is if you find a good deal, right? You don't have I don't have a real estate license. I've never had one, never gotten one. Um if I find a really good deal, which I've found plenty of very good deals, some of them are way out of my budget. Uh, and we're talking millions and millions out of my budget. But I know if the math works out. I know four or five guys I could bring it to and be like, I, I found this deal. I would like you guys coming as partners. Yeah. But all I'm asking for is a little equity in it and maybe to property manager or to something. But my, my percentage is going to be, I'm going to have you guys as partners on this, but I need 10 or 15 percent of it for free or five percent so there's right. you know those have worked i've done that um i think the last seven or eight deals i've done have literally been deals i found um that i didn't have enough cash to put in and but i found them and i got a free percentage because i found it so very cool i like that now yeah. in today's society like when right now real estate is booming the cost of everything is very expensive is now the time yeah. to sell or and maybe hold off on buying different properties or as as an investor in commercial properties you know when when is the right time to sell and what when is the right time to hold on and maybe look for different ways of uh you know, find an income, like maybe selling some previous uh, commercial buildings or, you know, is now a good time to actually jump into the gun and, and look around and try to find some deals? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there's always a good time to look. Um, I think uh, COVID was really unrealistic um, in, a, in a lot of eyes with this industry. Um, I know on the commercial side, um, it's not a good time to sell. I think, um, you know, people were getting a lot of money for what they were selling for a year ago to now. Um, and some people still think it's a year ago now and it's not. Yeah. Um, and so I think the best thing to do is if you could sell something, make a couple bucks, uh, do that. I think it's a really, really smart time now to have cash in hand. Um, I mm -hmm. think having cash in hand, um, understanding this market, um, getting through this next term, you know, to see what happens in this world a little bit. Um, I think you're also going to find a lot of, change within the eviction courts and all that stuff um mm -hmm. all the people that got these great rates and these great prices that's all starting to reset and um and that or it's interest only and it's too much and they can't afford it um those are going to be great ones to go and pick off in the court system and if you don't have cash um you know that's that's a toughie right there so i think as a first time person right now trying to rush out and grab something overpay I, unless you could find a really really good deal Mm -hmm. I don't think you do anything. I think the market is definitely slowing down. Um, I think people are a little bit concerned and nervous, but I think it's definitely slowing down. I think the best thing to do right now, have cash on hand. Yeah, I like that answer. I think that's a good answer because I think, uh, you know, things are starting to change, you know, and I don't think a lot of people realize it too. So people start, you know, are still thinking inflation, everything's high and so forth. And, you know, numbers are starting to come down a little bit, you know, but I don't think people realize right. how much they've come down and, uh, you know, having cash on you, I think at this time is, is, is a really good answer. Cause I think, 
that's, you know, that's a really good way to go right now where we're at, you know, because if you think about it, you know, all the rules and regulations that were put on and people got these great deals and, you know, and, you know, eventually they're going to have to start paying again and they're going to have to start, you know, laws are going to start changing because they already are starting to change. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's going to be, you're going to start to see, I think a lot of things pop up in the, in the next, you know, couple of years, one to two years, especially. What do you think? Yeah. And I think that's a great point. I think, you know, that this, I mean, the problem is we were kind of where we are now, not interest rate wise, but economy wise was really where we were before COVID. I mean, economy was normal. People went out the A, it was, you know, nothing was crazy. COVID gave everyone this unrealistic lifestyle, right? Everyone and their friend bought a nice car. Everyone thought they could fly private. Everyone thought they could go and buy, you know, I you could make $150,000 a year. And because of the interest rate, you could buy a million plus dollar house. But the, the math doesn't work out. If if you have that, it has to reset, you are screwed. You cannot yeah. afford that house. You can't even afford to put a new roof on your house if you needed to. So I think if you create this unrealistic almost empire in our brains that we were, that it was always going to be like this. I mean, I, I, during COVID at one point, I was a hundred percent. I had uh, uh, no vacancies in any of my properties, which is insane at the, at that, at that amount. Now I have a pretty good amount of vacancy because all the people that thought they could do something, which there's nothing against them. I'm, I'm all about, I mean, I'm in the spot of America dreams. I love people who are like, I'm going to start a company. Great. I want to be your guy and I hope it works. But a lot of people thought they could do certain things that were repetitive that already been mastered and have already worked in the US. And they tried to do it during COVID. And a lot of those tents now, two, three years later, are going like, hey, we can't do it. We give up. And 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 that sucks because that's that's really annoying. Cause I, you know, I spent a lot of time putting in time and investing and being there for you. And and you drank the Kool-Aid of, you know, what the US gave you. And I think right now, um business wise, financial wise. Um, like you said before, you know, the rates and all that stuff. Um, this won't be the new norm for rates, but yeah. I think you have to remember that when, if rates went down a point, then prices go up of mm -hmm. homes, real estate, every, everything, just that inflation goes up, you know, God forbid rates went down to five, you know, all that stuff's going to go back up again. Then you'll have a problem. Hey, I can't find a home. Hey, these properties are too expensive, blah, blah, blah. You know, before COVID, Industrial buildings were anywhere from fifty to eighty dollars a square foot. Now yeah. they were going for three hundred, two hundred fifty dollars a square foot. Wow! Um, you know that's that that's a lot of money. I I, I just yeah. I didn't buy anything like that. I, it didn't make sense for me. But some people had some serious cash, and so for me, it's just we're at a point where we do need to step back and just understand where we are in the economy. Um, that we're still, I think, in this teeter right now. Yeah, no, I agree with you, you know, and especially during COVID, you know, a lot of people got, you know, funding for this, that, and the other thing when they had businesses and stuff yeah. like that. And, you know, a lot of people got it and they spent it, you know, right away and yeah. not, you know, and it seemed like, you know, like you said, in the long run, it was going to hurt them, you know, by, by doing that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Yeah. That was a, uh, people were getting free money. So, Yeah. Now, when, when you've done this, you've done this for quite a while, almost 10 years, you said, you know, what are some of the major things that you've seen that, you know, maybe some common mistakes you see people make and some things that will really help people to grow if they're interested in going into the commercial industry? Yeah, I mean, I, I harp on it a lot because it's just the truth. And um, but uh, I would say, again, mentoring, you got to find someone who's got to do it. And, um, you know, I think. I've, you know, I probably have four or five mentors I use for different things. I have a mentor for how to do development. I have a mentor for my marketing side, mentor for my podcast. I don't ever want to feel like I'm above something or not educate on something. You need to be educating something. If we were going to go out tomorrow and start a, a roofing business, I would go find a roofing company here and probably go undercover and get a job with them and figure yeah. out how they do it and what they do wrong or, um, ask a couple guys like, Hey, what do you recommend? You know, I would just learn everything I can about that industry um, and try to do it the best I can. But the biggest thing that I've started to figure out right across the marketing platform, across the money platform is there's always a way to be different in any industry. There's always a way to do something different. And 
with the power of social media, I feel like you can, you can really, you know, understand kind of the power you could bring to it a little bit um, on that side. I think that being different people feel like very, very hard. Um, And, you know, when it came to us deciding, when it came to me, it's like when I wanted to do funding and I was like, Hey, look, I know I can't go to a bank and get a 15 or $20 million loan. Um, but that's the kind of stuff I want to buy. So I want to figure out how to do that. I'm going to skip the five and I'm going to skip the $10 million. I want to go right to 50 or 20. And so I went out and I spoke to my dad. I said, let's, I want to go interview a bunch of big guys and I want to see if they will do it. So we spent, we took a week, we went to about seven or eight offices and we went to our, um, mortgage broker and she had these two young guys and they had the same mindset as me. And I was like, well, we should try this. We start going back and forth. We started to figure out like what are all the biggest flaws in this? You know, is it, if I'm asking you for a hundred grand, what am I giving you? Am I giving you some crappy packet where you don't understand it? It's, you know, not good. So I was like, let's redevelop this. Let's make this better. Let's make this more exciting. Um, Let's not do these crazy annoying calls where we blow people up and do all that. Let's meet with them. And eventually if you can get, let's say 20 people and they can give you a couple hundred grand each, but you've met each one of them and they feel comfortable with it, then that's great. So we just redesigned that completely. And, um, and it's, you know, it's worked out great. I mean, I think right now we're currently underwriting probably about 40 to $50 million worth of stuff right now, just on that side, which would double that entire portfolio if we did it. So, um, you know, that was the same when it came up with the podcast and the same when I took over my dad's company, I just wanted to rebrand it and change it completely. Um, and so I think that's the, that's the reason those successes work is being completely different and changing something that it's been around, it's been done. Um, you know, the oldest of old timers who have done it. And then you had the next generation, the next generation. I'm like, now I'm in this generation. How can I be different from how they did it? You know, a hundred, 120 years ago. Right. Um, and that works great. So that, that, that's what I would tell people. You get, get a mentor, find something that can help you with it. If you can't do that, learn everything you can about it as much as you can. Keep learning, keep learning and get multiple mentors once you get to that spot and then do something different with it. Right. Well, that'd be my advice. When it comes to be doing being unique and, and sticking out from the rest, what are some of the things that you found were most effective that make you stand out more? Like from your own experience, you know, what made people recognize and, and look at you and come to you when they wanted to invest in commercial? real estate like what about you made you unique that because a lot of people you know they copy off of each other you see that all the time what did you do that made people recognize you what what stood out about you yeah so there's a couple things so on our commerce park investor side it's the company my dad and i own that is all based on us him and i buy things together we don't do thing on the commerce park vendor side that's the funding side the guys I partner with, they take care of all that. So I never have to worry about going out and being like, look what I do, blah, blah, blah. Because sometimes that's the, like people see as a, you know, they don't really like that. You know, they don't want to see all that. Um, so investment side, I, you know what it is? I've actually never raised any capital. I, I've never really done it myself. I don't think I'd have a problem. I think for on an attention, like how do you get attention? How do you get people to come to you? You know, if I took out the investment side and which and brought in the curious side of just like, yeah. what is this kid doing? What is going on here? Um, I think my social media, I think I just spent a lot of time. And again, I would watch all these guys. I'd watch everything they would do. And I'm just like, how come no one's t- like, how come no one brings me to a closing? Why can't I watch a YouTube video or, or a reel or a TikTok and be like, hey, today we're buying a $10 million building. And this is how you close on that. Like, that would be a cool video to watch. Like, yeah. that's a lot of money. And then what do you do after you buy it? Like, I want to see that part. And how do you manage that? So it's like, okay, so that's what we got to do. Um, And so we started doing clips like that. We started, you know, with the cameraman. And then there was just me trying to do myself. And it was coming out terrible. And and just, we started doing that. And then people really started going like, what's going on here? Can we, we want to do something with you. And, uh, but then, you know, the problem is the backlash came because then they would see some nice things and they'd be like, Oh, if I do that, then I get this. And I'm like, not exactly. That was, you know, <laughs> eight, nine years worth of work. And yeah. And so um, so I think there's a couple of things on that question of like basically the way you could promote yourself. Um and if that 
flows with what your business is. If I was strictly trying to get investors, I think my, my social media, my stuff, I would have it in a totally different angle. Um, I think I would take all my personal life out of it. I think I would try to keep a business, but I think for me, I've learned that that little bit of attention makes people curious enough to go like, what's going on here? Let me, let me dive deep, but you could still go onto like my social media and still be confused a little bit. And I, that was, it was really hard to do that. Cause you're like, I see this, I see that I see does this. I still don't know what I, what I'm, what's going on here. Right. And so I think to me, that's, that's the fun part about it. Um, but if I was in that different role, I think I'd be in, a, I would do something completely different. I think I would do more talk things. I think I would sit here and, and explain and be like, Hey, okay, here's this packet. Here's this property. Let me explain all these numbers. You don't understand on here. Right. Um, to me, I find that interesting. I think another, you know, 20 or 30 year old goes like, yeah, I don't, that's just not interesting to me. Yeah. So, right. It's kind of a juggle. And you have a podcast you were saying. So what about your podcast? It, like, what is it about and how does it, you know, what makes it different than other podcasts that talk about commercial real estate and so forth? Yeah. So that's the thing I am trying to, I'm going to do a podcast that has nothing to do with real estate. Okay, so cool. it's called the cash flow corner. Yeah. I just, you know what it is? I do it every day. I, I, I love what I do, but I do it every day. And I think you don't want to become a billboard. You become yeah. a billboard of who you are. And then I'm like, now I'm on like a Remax billboard out there and everyone. So I didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do is like when we talked about in the beginning is I was so interested on how that person made money, how this person made money. And just like as a sneak of, you know, we start shooting, we've been spending the last months with tests and all this stuff with the equipment. And so um, we have pretty good amount of people lined up on it right now. And just for the, the first three people are pretty interesting um, like the, one of the people we have is a three time Super Bowl champion from the 1995s, um, coming on. And for us was like, I want you to come on and I want you to tell me, you know, what did a football player make in 95? You know, yeah. that that's crazy. Like, you know, I bet what you made in 95 is what starting guys make now. So right. I want to understand the cash flow of different industries. We have, um, a, a pilot coming on for United Airlines who flies the big international routes, but he's been a pilot since 90 or 80s, 80s. And so yeah. he's gone through all the ups and downs and all that stuff. So I'm like, tell me what you're making then. Tell me what you're making that. How did the industry completely change it? So we we're just taking everyone's normal day careers, but we're finding people that have had the crazy stories about their career with the cash flow and all that stuff. Um, you know, I'll tell you the last person that we got was we're working on basically this uh this whistleblower person um from a uh from a medical group company that is telling us basically the scams and all the stuff going on and everything but it, like that's going to be wild and insane and that you know that'll be like another learning curve of blocking someone's voice out and darkening them on the side of the podcast while I sit there and yeah. talk to them and so it was just for me was I'm always interested in how people make money, how other people do it. And so this got me the opportunity to invite people on and have them tell me what they do and, and what they do now or if they change and how much they've changed since then. And, um, and so that's kind of the goal of it. Um, you know, there was a section of that where we thought like, Hey, let's make education videos. And, yeah. um, but I just don't know if I want to go down that road. I think if you could become, well-known successful at this and then people are going like ah, now he's got these stupid videos and now we don't even want to watch these other ones you know so yeah. um it's it's, it's a bit of trial and error you know i think it's great that you're kind of looking into like other people how they became like a millionaire or how they how they went from one aspect you know and they how they started out to the how they are now and what changed yeah. about it yeah And, um, you, you know, I find that very, very, very exciting. You know, so many people out there find it exciting also. Uh, you know, we found that, um, I know, like Alex Mosey, 
you know, you have Grant Cardone, you have Dan Locks, you have mm -hmm. all these people who talk about, you know, how they made it from zero to where they are today, you know, but it, and I think it kind of looks a little easy when you look at it on, you know, social media, you know, the, it, it sounds so glorified, you know, but Alex Samozzi will tell you that, you know, he failed X amount of times before he, you know, I think he had seven failed businesses before he actually went and actually succeeded in his first business and then grew his way up. To, to his stardom to where he is now and you know and then i think it was um who was it oh um top of my head I can't think of his name he's a, he's another one um he he had a he was a speaker also and he he had a room he, he i think he rented out a room for 5000 people and only 500 showed up you know and so he was mm. it, it wasn't 500 i'm sorry it was five that showed up he said he talked to those five people like there was five thousand people in the room and uh mm. you know it, it's just like you know it's it's interesting how people they start from scratch or they start you know in the beginning and what what it what uh, seems like you know nothing now was something back then but you know between you know trying to overcome your failures and between starting out at a you know at, at a smaller uh, um scale they grew themselves up they didn't they, they they never gave up was the whole thing absolutely and i think that that's the most important thing right there is sometimes right when you think you're at the bottom you know essentially there's only one way up right when you're at the bottom but you yeah. you have to keep going there's going to be a breaking point and i think um you know if you have a realistic goal and uh and someone used to tell me that like i used to come up with all these little silly goals in each year and one day I was out to a dinner and someone said like, Hey, what are your goals? And I was like, Oh, I, you know, I want to make my first million dollars, um, in two years. It was my first starting out. And, and she's like, Oh, uh, is that a realistic goal? And I said, well, I think so. And she was like, well, how, what have you done to make that realistic? And I said, well, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. And she's like, so then why would you create a goal that's unrealistic for yourself? So I, like that's stuck in my brain is like, I'm creating all these goals every year to be like, I want to do this and I want to get to this spot and whatever it is. But I never put next to any of those goals, how I'm going to get there. What am I going to do? What do I have to do? And then putting realistic times, like what I should have done is made that goal and said, I'm going to have that as in five or eight years, or I'm going to have that in 10 years. And I know how I'm going to do that. And, and then go from there. Right. And, and I just, from then I changed everything, how I did all that stuff. Um, and then I, you know, I, I, I forget who it was. I don't know if it was, my father told me to do it, but I think it came from um, uh, Tony Robbins maybe did it, but he's, uh, he said once write a check of the amount you want, post date it, obviously void it on the back and then hang it up and look at it every day. So I would write a million dollar check and I had it for this, uh, yeah, December 31st, 2025 and uh, it's still sitting up on my board and um and so but it's one day i want to be able to actually like write that check and sign over to myself um so there's there's so many things that i think on that analogy of um what we're talking about it i don't know just uh i lost my train of thought but but yeah, so it, but I think it, it's really important to have those goals and have those expectations to where you, you need to be and what you want to do. And I think it's it's important in all those people that you mentioned before, not giving up and all that stuff. It, there, it's going to happen, right? But if 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 you sit here and go like, I'm gonna I'm gonna create a, a you know, a hundred fifty million dollar HVAC company that I've never done before, and I'm gonna do it all by myself, and I have until next year to finish it. That's unrealistic. You need yeah. to need to take the goal off, the amount off, or just give up on the idea. Um, right. because you could, you could get there. I don't, I think there's plenty of companies that have done that. I, you know, I know rotor rooters nationwide and they're a plumbing company. They figure out how to do that. Yeah. So I think it's just stop putting these unrealistic goals in front of yourself, um, and start putting realistic ones. And maybe some of them don't need a timeline. Um, and then work towards that instead of working towards a large picture, work towards little ones and get there and then see how much it's completed once you get there. So. I like that idea a lot. I th I think it's it's really great because you know you brought up a really good um, ideas where you just don't create a trajectory, 
but set goals and time frames of where you want them to be. You know, a lot of people just like you said, okay, in three months I want to be here, six months I want to be here, and in in it, you know, nine months here, and in a year I want to ha have this much money. And but then they don't set the realistic goals of how they're going to get it. So without keeping, I, I think a structured, you know, plan. I think that's what it all comes down to is keeping a structured plan. How are you going to get there? What steps are you going to take to get to step number, you know, level one to level two to level three, and then try and you know, you could add on ideas and so forth as you go along. But I, I think a lot of times people you know, forget to write all those goals and to add things on, you know, to get them to climb up the ladder. And then they, they wonder why, how come I'm not growing? How come I'm not expanding the way I want to? Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Now, if you had to emphasize to the listeners today, everything that we talked about, what are some things you really like the listeners to, you know, uh, understand that you feel is important yeah, I would say, you know, we hit some really good topics on just like, you know, self-inspiration and then, you know, self-motivation. But I think, um, you know, there are days where they're tougher than other. And um, I think for you, I think it's really important to have uh, positive things around you. And, um, you know, one big thing I'd say it's really, really important is, you know, mental health. I think as you endeavor into these challenges and these hard things and, um, all this stuff is that you got to put yourself first. Um, and when it goes into those goals, it's, you know, making those realistic things, but it's also making these realistic expectations for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I think brain wise, it's super, super important to have people around you, whether it's your spouse, um, whether it's a family member or a parent, cousin, that is around you during these times that is only a positive influence. Um, I don't care if they say, you know, you're going to start something that's unrealistic, but they're like, you know what, go for it. And um, if you don't have that, you need to change where you are. You need to change your environment. Um, and I think for me, I did that. You know, I lived in Virginia for five years before I came back to New Jersey. My environment out there was great, awesome family, but I was at a stop in point in my life. I feel like I couldn't get any, I couldn't do anything more out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I made the decision to come back here, it completely ramped up. Two different cities, two different things. Um, but I had to change my environment. I had to change up what was going on. And, uh, and even coming back here, I still had to change my group of friends. I came back. I moved back here. I lived in New Jersey my entire life. Um, when I moved back here, probably five or six years later, I got rid of every single friend and I started fresh. And I don't, I didn't want to know you from high school. I didn't want to know you from middle school. I didn't want to know you because you knew me. I don't want, I don't care about you. you know, I need to start fresh. So when I did that, it was great. I started picking up people that were, we could be assets to each other in life. Um, we could be there for each other in life. And if you weren't, then it was great. Fine. Goodbye. Have a good one. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and that worked out really, really well. And I know that's hard for some people, but a, a clean slate is, uh, is really, really important for your brain. Oh, I agree a hundred percent. I think, you know, you made some really good points, you know, and that is so true. Mental health is number one. You really have to give yourself a lot of less self-love and self-care. And when your mental health is intact and you, and you're giving yourself that self-care that you need, you know, you feel strength, you feel that abundance, you feel that you can, you know, topple the world. And, and you also, you're, 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 you're saying your, your mental health affects your physical health. So you physically, right. you know, uh, most of the times you're healthier when your mental health is intact. So it's really important to keep everything all in one and to really, like you said, focus on that positive mentality. And I like that you, you know, you've looked around your environment and said, okay, who is bringing me down and who's going to bring me up, you know, and being able to just, you know, nicely separate yourself from those people and just look for better people that had goals, either probably your same level or higher and, you know, and you kind of were a reinforcement to each other too. And probably that helped you a lot also in your, in your road to success. Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell everybody about your website now. Where can they find you if they want to find more information about you and what you do? Yeah. So my biggest thing is my Instagram. It's Spencer Pascal. Uh, you'll see a picture of my face. Um, and, uh, and that's why I, you know, I use that as my major platform for myself. Uh, my company is commerce park investors. That's the name of the Instagram. 
Um, and then we have a company website, but um, you know, that doesn't have too much on it, but that's commerceparknj.com. Um, but you know, I, I share some of my work stuff on my personal, but you know, if you want to see the behind the scenes, basically of what I do every day, uh, between traveling, between work to do all that, uh, my Instagram's that's, that's the spot to be, uh, it's pretty energetic, pretty fun and lots of cool stuff going on. So. Awesome. This has been great, Spencer. I, I really enjoyed having you on the show. I think you really brought out a lot of great information about commercial uh, investing. Also, you know, different ways that you could help yourself in any industry. If you really look at some of the steps you were talking about, even though it pertained to um, commercial investing, you know, just some of the tips you gave, you know, are t tips that you could use universally, you know, and people have to understand when is the right time to hold your money? When's the right time to invest, right. to really look into things and to research things before you just jump into it. Because so many people get overly excited. They jump into it and then boom, you know, a mistake occurs and then they suffer from it. So, you know, I, I think that was a great point that you made. And, you know, just the, all the tips that you gave today were fabulous. And I, I really appreciate your Thank time, you. your ideas and your energy. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Oh, great. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.